It is good to be home. Very good to be home. Um, man, yeah, I don't know, just being here, hearing everyone sing. Um, if this is your first time in this community, this is an awesome community. And um, as I was singing that song, um, I don't know if we can get that, that picture up again about that wall. Do you have that there, Daniel? But those lyrics of, there isn't, a wall that our God won't kick down. And I just love that graphic because I just saw God like just physically just kicking it down like one of those crazy movies, um, you know, where there's someone on the other side and like the superhero just comes in and kicks down that wall. And um, I don't know where you're at today, but I hope that you see that um, we serve a God here who there isn't a wall that is tall enough that he won't kick down. Um, he loves you that much. He's relentless with his love. Um, he wants to do something in your life. And that's, that's who we are as a church, Grace Gate. I've been away um, for a few weeks in South Africa, and Zoz and I had an awesome time. Um, except that last night when we got in the car and um, she was sharing with Kelsey, she said, yeah, the trip felt like a service trip. Um, so we were grafting quite hard, um, doing a bit of work over there as well. But we had such a good time. Um, it's always good to be in South Africa um, especially when the rugby is on and South Africa is winning a few games. Um, but even more so, it's good to be back. And um, I so miss this place. And um, I heard a few people missed us as well. So that's cool to know. Um, but today we're going to continue with the last session of the moral of the story. And have you guys enjoyed the series so far? Um, I have heard that, yes, yeah, Stephen and um, Jordan and actually the whole team, because look at this. Like this stage is amazing. Um, I saw this on our group chat, and I was showing everyone in South Africa, all the guys, I was like, man, do you guys do this stuff at your church? <laughs> and i um, so proud of, yeah, just the team and everyone who's been serving over the past couple of weeks. Um, we heard amazing things that happen at Salt and the kids' camps, and um, just love, yeah, your heart for God and the difference that you guys make in this community. But we've been journeying through the moral of the story, and today is the last session of um, the parables that we're going to look at today. And um, today it's the parable of the sower. So I don't know if you've ever read the parable of the sower or if not, but it's found in Matthew chapter 13. And as I was reading um, this parable, this story, I was thinking that, man, this to me, and I could be wrong, so don't, don't quote me today or, yeah, you can look it up, but I think this parable is all about competence, all right. I think this, this, this parable echoes the word competence. And um, if you're not too sure what competence is, I just got a dictionary definition of what it looks like. And this is what it says. It says, properly or sufficiently qualified, capable. Properly or sufficiently qualified, capable, or adequate for the purpose. Competence. And I feel today... As we go through this session of um, this parable and as we read what Jesus is teaching here, I feel that competence is going to be echoed over and over and over again. Now, do you guys value competence? Yeah? Who's not too sure? There's a few who are not too sure. Okay, cool. I wrote some things down on my phone, and I was thinking about this as we were traveling back, and I thought, I'll ask you guys some questions so you can see how much you actually value competence, all right? Would you rather have an incompetent or a competent pilot? How many would think, oh, yeah, incompetent? Yeah, that's probably not too bad if they at least know how to take off, like if they don't get the landing, right? No, all of us would want what? Competent, right? Um, how about... Would you rather have an incompetent skipper or captain of a ship um, or a competent one? All right. What Zalia didn't mention in the part of the scuba diving and the manta ray was that um, I got really sick um, for two of the dimes on the boat. And I don't know if you've got seasick and you try and eloquently throw up without anyone seeing. All right. But that happened to me about six times. First time, Zolia didn't even know I threw up three times. She thought I was just leaning over looking at the fish. All right? 
But I want someone who's competent, right? Who can actually have, be a great captain and actually won't make me get so seasick, all right? How about, um, would you rather have an incompetent or a competent Uber driver? Competent. And I know there's some guys in our church here who've actually experienced an incompetent Uber driver, all right? Um, how about this one? An incompetent dentist or a competent dentist? Yeah, exactly. I mean, all of us would want someone who's competent. We wouldn't like the dentist to say to us, hey, I'm sorry, but um, we actually did the wrong tooth of the root canal, so we'll actually just have to do the next one, right? We want someone who's competent, and we put so much trust in them, right? Like a pilot, skipper, everyone, we have so much trust that they'll actually just be competent. Um, what about a surgeon? Incompetent or a competent surgeon? Yeah. Chef, man, if you want to see people get angry about their food, right? If it's not cooked well, like, come on, what's wrong with you? Um, what about a barista? Incompetent or competent barista? Yeah, we want our coffee to taste good, right? And um, this has to be the gem for me. Like, who would want, all right, incompetent all blacks on the field? Huh? They're probably every South African, right? So there are some things there probably, yeah, we do want incompetent, you know. Um, maybe it's the tax man. We would want an incompetent tax man. Maybe. I'm not sure. All right. I don't know. But generally, 100% of the time, we would rather have someone that's competent than incompetent. And it's amazing how actually we put so much trust. I thought about it last night while we were flying. I thought, I don't even know the pilot. I don't actually know if he's actually that good, right? But we actually just go with the flow and like, oh, we'll, we'll put our lives at risk. Yeah, you know, we just trust in something and someone that we actually don't know, but we're hoping that they're so competent. And Jesus in this parable of the sower, I feel, and I said, I could be wrong, but I feel he's speaking about competence here. And he's actually saying like, hey, um, this parable, I want to show you what competent actually looks like. So we're going to kick it off, and it's found in Matthew 13, and um, this is how it starts. It says, that same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat, and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Jesus had recently, just in the chapter before, he had been teaching and healing sick people, and Interestingly enough, the Pharisees continually came to him and said, hey, um, we actually want a sign. We want a sign. We, we want to see if you are truly the Messiah, if you are truly um, who you say you are. And here he is now. He's, he's at a full day. Um, large crowd is still gathering around him. They want him to heal more people um, to the extent that he actually gets up and gets on a what? On a boat, right? He gets on a boat and he starts teaching um, to all these people, and this is what he says. He says, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, He says, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. And today, because we have such an awesome creative team, we're going to try and illustrate this in the best way that Jesus would have try to illustrate what this parable is actually teaching about. I heard yesterday one of these broke while they were moving them. So. But here we have the first soil, all right, that Jesus is actually teaching on. If we go one back, again, um, he says, as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. So here we have Jesus just telling the story. It could be a true story. It could be a story that he's just making up. That's what a parable is with a point. Um, he could have been just gazing into the hills in the distance and seeing a lot of farmers um, and thought, hey, this will be a good time to actually just share this story, um, this parable. And so he grabs some seed. Hopefully I can open this. I don't know if I can. Yeah, this might take a while. Check your phone pick. We can edit that on the camera, right? <laughs> anyway, he grabs some seeds. Thanks, Blair. What a guy. 
grab some seeds. Who grabs some seeds? The farmer, right? The guy who sows the seeds. Grabs some seeds, and he chucks them on the path, okay? This is, this is some seed that falls on the path. Some seeds are going to fall on other places. So that's the first one. And then what happens? Birds came, and it ate it up, all right? Go, go on to the next one. He says, then some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. Next slide. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no roots. So yeah, Jesus says, hey, all right, so the sower grabbed the one, the, the seed, he threw it on um, the path, the first one, and then he threw it on what? What's this? The rock, okay? The rocky places. And if you look at the bottom, you'll see a whole bunch of rocks, all right? So yeah, some more soil, um, some more seed falls on this soil, which is the rocky soil, okay? And there's a plant that sprung up, sprung up, but then what happened? Sun came, scorched it, and it withered away, all right? Because it had no root. He goes on and he shares this next part of a story. Other seed fell among some thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. So here we have the other soil, and um, the word there is thorns or weeds, if you want to use that word. And basically, yeah, Jesus says, hey, some of the seed fell on this soil, um, thorny soil, weed soil, and um, it choked the plants, all right? And then the last one, he says, still other seed fell on what soil then? Good soil, all right? And so this seed that falls on good soil, what actually happens? Yeah, it's awesome. This is the seed that actually we had produced a crop 160 or 30 times what was sown, right? So this is a massive increase to the seed that actually he, he um, sowed. And then it goes on, and he, and he ends it like this. He says, whoever has ears... Let them hear. All right. Now, if you heard that story, would you get anything from it? Maybe, right? And, and this is interesting because a lot of the parables, Jesus just shares the story, all right, and he walks away. That's what he does. And, and he leaves it there, all right? And what's interesting is the disciples who were the guys who were following him, they actually come to him and they say, hey, like, Jesus, what are you talking about? Why are you talking in parables? And if we go in the next um, few slides, next one, next one, thanks. Yeah, yeah, he says, hey, why do you speak to the people in parables? Like, can't you just communicate clearly and say your point? What's, what's the point? Like, what's the moral of the story that you're trying to get across? And he goes on, and then this is what he responds, and he says, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. I love Jesus' response here, because he's saying, hey, there's some secrets about the kingdom of heaven. There's some gems about the kingdom of heaven. There's some gems about who Jesus is, about his grace, and about his truth. And he says, hey, this has been given to you. To who? The disciples, the guys who were following him, the guys who were actually not, not making the cut all the time, who were getting things wrong all the time, these things were actually revealed to them, but not to the others. And to the others who'd be speaking, to farmers, to fishermen, to Pharisees, to Sadducees, to, to all the people who just weren't getting what Jesus had come to actually try and communicate. And he goes on and he says, whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. And then he says, whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. But this is why I speak to them in parables. And this is good. He says, though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. He says, hey, even if they saw it, they don't actually even see it. And even if they hear it, they still don't understand. And I'm sure Jesus would actually be, be using this as an illustration because the Pharisees who were around him, 
just a chapter before are questioning him, are saying, hey, we want a sign. We, we want to see that you are truly the son of God. We want to see the secrets of the kingdom of God. And he's saying, even if they saw it, they still wouldn't believe. They still wouldn't hear. They still wouldn't understand. And he goes on then, and yeah, he quotes, and, and he says, hey, this is actually a prophecy of Isaiah that has been fulfilled. But he says, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. What is Jesus speaking about here? What is he saying? He sums it up like this, and he says, for this people's heart has become callous. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts in turn, and I would heal them. Jesus is saying, yeah, hey, I want you to know that these people who are around you, the guys who you would think would be the most competent followers of Jesus, in other words, the Pharisees, the guys who knew the law, who knew the scripture, he said, hey, they've actually hardened their hearts. Their hearts are hard. they calloused. And he says then they, they actually closed their eyes. And I love, if we go one back, thanks, this part where it says, understand with their hearts. I love this. He says that, hey, it's, he, they don't understand with their minds but they actually understand with their hearts. And this is what the disciples were doing. And when they understand with their hearts, they turn. There's action. They change. There's something that shifts because it's not a head knowledge anymore. It's a heart knowledge. And that's what Jesus is trying to say, that I've come to try and bring life transformation. And he says, and I would heal them. Now, unlike other parables, there's probably only a few where Jesus would share the parable and then he'd actually give the meaning. And this now is where Jesus actually gives the meaning to the disciples. So listen up. If you're not following, try and get this. This is what he's saying. All right, go to the next slide. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it. The evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Jesus is saying, hey, I want you guys to get the path, all right? This is the path here. The path symbolizes someone who hears the word, in other words, the word of God, and then does what? What happens? They don't they don't understand it, right? I don't get it. I don't get God's grace. I don't get God's truth. I, like, man, it just doesn't really make sense to me. And then what happens is there's actually an enemy. There's an enemy who comes and snatches away the seed that actually has been sown on the path. Jesus says, this is that path, all right? Someone who hears but doesn't understand. He goes on and he says then, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word, all right, and at once rejoices it with joy, all right, or receives it with joy, sorry. And, and that's where, hey, yeah, the seed has been sown, falls on this rocky ground, and they're like, man, this seed is good. This is helpful. This is God's word. This is life-transforming stuff that God is speaking into my life. We receive it, and, and this plant takes roots, all right? But then what happens? It says, but since they have no roots, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. In other words, hey, it, it's great to hear the secrets of the kingdom of God, but I mean, it gets difficult. Life gets hard, and then it just gets thrown away. There's, there's no deep roots, then Jesus goes on, and he says, The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of life, this life, and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. He says, man, this is someone who hears the word, but hey, the worries of life, 
and the deceitfulness of wealth just choke this plant so that it cannot grow, so that it cannot be fruitful. And then the last one, he says, but the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands, who hears the word and understands it. I love this. I love this illustration that Jesus is, is sharing here by all these different soils. And, and what he's actually sharing is that the seed is actually his word. The seed is his word. The seed is the good news. The seed is the gospel. The seed is who God is and what he wants to do in our lives. That's the seed that he's thrown. And, and the soil, if we look at the soil, the soil is our hearts. Our hearts. The path, yeah, again, it says it's here, hears but doesn't understand. The rocky places, we hear and it receives, but there's no root. Here, the thorny soil is, hey, we hear, but the worries of life just choke us out. And yeah, the good soil produces fruitfulness. You see, what's interesting about this is that no farmer, right, would sow seed and not want to harvest, right? I mean, every farmer who sows seed, they want to harvest. They want something to actually grow. I mean, that's how we know that they're actually competent farmers is that they, they'll produce something, right? There'll be something that actually produces. And I love this now because if you take a look at all these different soils, each one of us are situated in one of these soils. I don't know where you are today. Maybe some of you are here at this soil, at the path. And I thought about this path a bit, and I thought, how does a path actually form? How does a path actually form? Because the path, the problem with the path here that Jesus is speaking about is he's saying it's too hard for the seed to actually penetrate in through the ground. And the only way a path gets hard is when people walk over it, right? The more people walk over a path, the harder and harder it actually gets. And I believe Jesus was actually saying, yeah, he was actually saying, you know what? Some of you have been walking over by a lot of people over and over and over again. And, and your heart has grown hard against who God is because of some incompetent followers of Jesus who have tried to show you a different perspective, a judgmental perspective, or a perspective that actually has just hurt you. And what the farmer wants to show you today is actually, hey, I want to come into this hard path soil and actually soften it up. And the only way I can do that is, is if he comes in and he actually waters it. He just overflows that soil with his love, his grace, his forgiveness. He says, hey, I understand what you've been through because actually I've been through everything that you've been through and more. And I want to soften that. And all you have to do is just allow me to do that. You see, the incredible thing about the soils is that the soils actually don't have to do anything except just receive the farmer who actually can work in on it. If we look at the, the next soil, and we see these rocks, and the interesting thing about the rocks is, is that this soil is basically all about the roots. It's about the roots. It's, it's about the stuff that isn't seen. All right, The plant looks pretty good, right? It looks pretty good. It looks healthy. But actually, we know that actually it's not going to take root because there's some rocks that are actually not providing it with the nourishment and probably the stability that it actually needs to survive. And what Jesus is saying, he's saying is, hey, some of you are in this space in your life. Some of you have such huge rocks in your life, and actually, it doesn't matter how pretty it looks on the outside, all right, it's never going to get the stability that you actually need to actually grow and be fruitful. And he's saying, hey, I want to get in there and I want to remove those rocks. Just let me. He said, hey, some of the, 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 
I think the Pharisees were just like, you know, they couldn't see this. They couldn't understand this because it wasn't a head thing. It's a heart thing. It's where God's saying, hey, I want to come in and I want to excavate. I want to take out those rocks. You know what those rocks are today that God wants to remove that is actually, you know, it, it's not helping you become fruitful. He wants to remove that. He's saying, hey, that's my job. I want to do that. And then we get to the next soil, the thorns and the weeds. And what's interesting about this soil and what I think Jesus is saying about competency is actually this whole plant, like the weeds, actually take over the roots, but also the physical plant itself, right? So actually the roots are being destroyed as well as the plant. And all because it, it says the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth. I don't know about you, but this week as I was, as I was looking at this, I thought, man, this is where I'm at today. This is where I'm at. Because the worries of life are clouding my view of the sun and who Jesus is. And it's actually all these weeds are just suffocating. They're just choking all the life out of me. Where I actually I can't actually see the gardener actually wanting to come and take out all these weeds. A couple of um, months ago, or actually probably about a year ago, um, Zolz and I decided, hey, we, we want to start a veggie garden. And um, we went and got all these seedlings and um, we planted them. And we were rookies at this because at the end of the, the season when everything came up, we were like, man, our carrots are flourishing, all right? Because like there was just a massive big like green bunch at the top. And eventually we thought, hey, let's pull them out and see how they look. And we pulled them out and like they were all joined together like this because we didn't plant them one by one. We just planted them all on top of each other. So it was miserable. Yeah, carrots didn't look that bad. Oh, they looked really bad in that time. But um, one of the things that we also planted, we thought, man, broccoli is kind of expensive, um, so let's plant heaps. And I think we had, was it 12? 12 broccolis, all right? And we were just like, man, this stuff is good. And um, Zal said, hey, one day we're going to cut all of them. And we got so many left, and they about to all die, so she's going to make a broccoli soup. And that was cool. She made this broccoli soup. And um, she was living across the road to our church and said, hey, Wes, come for lunch. And I went to her house, and um, someone else was there as well and said, hey, come for lunch. We've got broccoli soup, massive broccoli soup. And we started eating this broccoli soup, and I was like, man, this stuff is good. And as I was eating it, I saw this white thing in there. And I said, man, that looks like a worm to me. And I said to Zol, Zol, is that a worm? And she looked at it said, no, it's just a piece of barley. Something like that, you know. I said, oh, okay. Kept eating. We we're almost finished. And I took another bite and I said, that's a worm. And I looked n closely. There was hundreds of worms in the soup, okay. So Zolz and I, we instantly stopped eating. Our friend kept eating. We just went on. But. What amazes me about that story is like, man, those broccolis actually looked so good, but they were covered in worms, hundreds of worms. Like we, we couldn't believe that we had missed so many worms in the soup, right? How do you miss that? But I feel this is what Jesus is actually saying. He's saying like, man, there's some weeds that are, that are covering you, that are clouding your judgment, and you're lonely. You're living in isolation, in darkness, that I actually just want to come and bring life and fruitfulness into your life. And then the last soil, the soil that produces a good crop, and I love this end part. This is how the story actually ends. It says, this is the one who produces. In other words, this is the one who's, who's competent, in other words, this is the one who actually grows a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And apparently, this is like a miracle. Like no farmer would ever expect to yield 160 or even 30 times what was actually sown. I mean, seven to 10 times, they say that would be great. But to sow that much just from the seed. And I love this part because this part reflects 
the competency, not of the soil necessarily, but actually of the, the farmer and the one who sows, because he's the one who sowed this stuff, and this, this stuff actually got sowed in the wrong places, right? But, but this seed actually got sowed in the right soil, the one that was actually receptive. And I love this because this is the picture that I see God. This is my picture of God. This is my clear picture of who God is and what He wants to do in my life. And I'm so glad that I have a God who is actually all about competency. Like He's been through everything. He's the one who's actually going to turn this hardened soil into something like this that produces. It's not up to me. It's just up to my willingness and saying, hey, God, here I am. I love this because this plant reflects so much health. It reflects the nourishment, the, the stability, the stuff that actually God is saying, hey, this is what I want you to hold on to. This is the whole point of the parable of the sower. He wraps it up, drops the mic, and walks off stage. I'm amazed at these parables because they're ancient. I mean, they're so many years old, and I don't know if any of us actually are farmers. Are there any farmers? There are a few gardeners. Yeah, there are a few. But I mean, this makes so much sense into our world today, into our reality, because some of us are somewhere. Some of our hearts are at some point. And today as we end off, I want to actually ask you during this next um, creative that we're going to end the program with and also in this week, so not just today, but actually in this week, I want you to do a bit of an evaluation on your soil. Where, where do you actually think your heart is at? All right? Where is your heart at? And once you've figured out where your heart is, then, then what I want you to do is I want you to evaluate, hey, what needs to be done? Because what Jesus wants to do is actually he wants to come in and he wants to change that soil. He wants to bring transformation to that soil so actually it can produce and there can actually be life. So maybe you find yourself in this hardened soil. Then actually, hey, just this path that, you know, the enemy keeps coming and stealing the seed. Once you hear the word, then it keeps getting stolen. Then come to God and just say, hey, God, you know where I'm at, yeah? Please help. Maybe if you find yourself here yeah, in the rocky soil, then maybe take some time to evaluate what are those rocks. What are those rocks that are actually stealing all the nourishment and stability of your life and what Jesus actually wants from you? And then actually ask him, God, like, I can't do this myself. No soil over here does anything by itself. It actually needs the gardener to come in and to do the work for it. And say, God, I need you to come and help me to remove those rocks. And then maybe if you find yourself in the thorny soil or in the weeds, try and evaluate what are those weeds? What are the things that are actually, you know, just stealing and choking me? What are those worries of life? What is the deceitfulness of wealth? Where am I getting confused? Where is there deception in my life? God, reveal that to me and come help take it away. And then also think about, hey, maybe if... If this is you, then maybe you also think like, hey, what are the roots that I can focus on that can even dig down deeper, that can give even more, more roots? What are those things? And, and speak to God about that so that, hey, yeah, I can see these are the roots that I want to work on. These are the things that I want to fill my life up with that is going to produce this crop. God, today, as we just open your word and as we read it, uh, we can see and we can connect with it in so many different ways, Lord. And today, God, I just want to pray for each and every person in this community. You know where our hearts are at. You know what we're journeying through. You know the struggles. You know the hardened calluses that some of us have. You know the paths that we've journeyed on. You know the enemies that keep stealing the seed from us, God. And I want to pray that you can break through any walls that you can break through any challenges that we face, God. And today, we pray that we can evaluate and we can just bring you any, anything that is separating us from who you are and what you want for our lives, God. We thank you so much that you're a competent gardener, that you know what you're doing, that the seed that you sow will grow, 
And God, I pray that we can just respond to that and we can say, hey, God, um, don't let people move us away from you. Don't let the worries of this world, don't let wealth, don't let anything that distracts us from who you are and what you want for our life, God. God, I pray today for us and I pray that we'll just follow you and that we can be competent followers of Jesus as we just actually say, hey, yes, our heart. We surrender our heart to you today. So God, during this time now and in this week, reveal that to us and help us to take our next step in our faith journey. This is our prayer and acceptance of your love and your saving grace in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.